Good uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Thomas Metzger, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of all the organizers to this last seminar. Prior to our workshop on uh, ultra-fast anti-ferromagnetic writing, um, on Monday and Tuesday, the 19th of May next week. Um, together with our colleagues, we brought together the leading experts in the field to um, identify the next step to initiate a breakthrough in uh, the field towards the fastest and least dissipative uh, writing of anti ferromagnetic waves. Um, we organized this mini webinar series of online lectures. Uh, by experts who are in closely related but already established fields like the theory of antiferromagnetism, uh, ultrafast magnetism, and today we will hear about uh, antiferromagnetic uh, spintronics. With this, we wanted to stimulate the participation of early stage researchers in uh, the workshop. And all these lectures are given uh, prior to our next week's in person conference, and they're hosted in the same fashion as uh, the prestigious by Spin Plus X seminars. That means around one hour of uh, talk, followed by some time reserved for questions. Since uh, these lectures are organized in a Zoom webinar format, all attendees are muted, and I would like to ask you to just uh, raise your hand um, or write in the Q&A. You will be then promoted to be a panelist and can ask the question yourself. Also, please keep in mind that uh, all these talks will be recorded. They are live streamed on YouTube and will be uh, available later. That being said, it is uh, my very great pleasure to welcome Professor uh, Thomas Jungert and thank him um, already for kindly accepting this uh, invitation to provide this webinar, this lecture. Um, Professor Jungert is uh, head of the Department of Spintronics and Nanoelectronics at the Academy of Sciences in the Czech Republic. And he is professor at the School of uh, Physics and Astronomy in Nottingham. Um, introduce him briefly. I think he's a very well known expert in, in our field. He graduated with the Master of Science uh, at the Charles University in 1991. And a few years later from the same institution with a PhD in condensed matter physics at the Charles University. Uh, he became already full professor in 2004 at the University of Nottingham in uh, UK. And in 2007, since then, he is head of the Department of Spintronics and uh, Nanoelectronics in the Czech Republic. His uh, research interests uh, cover, cover a significant range of topics, and I would like to emphasize only a few of them, uh, namely condensed matter physics and material science, spin orbit coupling phenomena, symmetry and topology of uh, non-magnetic, ferromagnetic, anti-ferromagnetic, as well as ultramagnetic system. He uh, received an impressive number of uh, honors and awards, uh, including memberships in the Academy of Europe um, and the Learned Society uh, in the Czech Republic. And uh, lately he received the, the Czech Minister of Education Prize in 2020 and the Neuron Endowment Prize in 2018. That only as a, as a very brief introduction, I would like to uh, stop sharing my screen and ask Professor Jungert Please go ahead and, and start whenever you like. Uh, thank you, Thomas, uh, for uh, for the introduction and. Uh, Good afternoon, uh, everybody. So uh, the, the broad topic of today's talk is uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics. Uh, but since uh, there have been uh, uh, several topical reviews already published in the uh, recent literature on antiferromagnetic uh, spintronics, I <coughs> uh, uh, have a possibility today uh, to give uh, not only a tutorial over this uh, broad field, of antiferromagnetic spintronics that have been developing uh, uh, extensively over the past decade. But also uh, this gives me a chance to focus uh, a bit more also on the most recent developments um, <clears throat> that are occurring at the intersection of several fields. Uh, besides spintronics, it's uh, ultra-fast optics, neuromorphics uh, in antiferromagnets, but this also uh, has uh, led us to uh, a recognition of an unconventional 
uh, magnetic phase that we call ultra magnets and that uh, <laughs> we believe can have uh, uh, significant relevance not only to all these fields but also uh, to many other areas in condensed matter physics. And so uh, <laughs> while on the previous slides, uh, there were a few uh, review uh, article references on the uh, general field of endoferromagnetic spintronics. Uh, here on this slide, I <coughs> give a few examples of more recent uh, publications, which include uh, both original works, but also uh, up to uh, review articles. So <clears throat> let me move on to uh, first to the outline of uh, today's lecture. So I uh, will divide the lecture into three uh, parts. In the first part, <clears throat> I will talk about, <clears throat> let's say the classic uh, switching scenario uh, in magnets, uh, whereby classic, I mean that uh, following an excitation, uh, <clears throat> the magnetization or the magnetic order vector uh, does not change significantly its magnitude but at the end of the process, the magnetic order vector reverses <clears throat> or changes uh, its orientation. So I would call it this classical uh, magnetization orientation scenario. And uh, the typical time scales uh, that are governing this classic scenario <clears throat> are determined by the relatively weak uh, relativistic uh, uh, anisotropy, magnetic anisotropy energy. And because it's a relatively, relatively weak uh, energy scale, it corresponds to uh, relatively long uh, typical time scales. Uh, and here we are talking about nanoseconds or maybe hundreds of picoseconds. <clears throat> and this applies to ferromagnets. If we talk about this classical, uh, classic uh, magnetization reorientation scenario in anti ferromagnets, where again, uh, uh, its signature would be a reorientation of the antiferromagnetic nail vector, but uh, without a significant change of its magnitude. <clears throat> and then the time scale because of the antiferromagnetic order is uh, uh, shorter. And this is because the energy that governs this time scale is uh, exchange enhanced. So that brings us typically to uh, two or three orders of magnitude shorter time scales of this classic reorientation scenario in antiferromagnets. And this has been one of the prime uh, motivations uh, for uh, many groups uh, uh, around the world to uh, be interested scientifically in uh, uh, switching and spintronic uh, phenomena in devices in antiferromagnets. <clears throat> now in the second part, uh, I will move on to uh, the ultra fast uh, scenario which uh, in all uh, considered magnets uh, involves a significant change in the magnitude of the magnetic order vector, uh, meaning that it uh, involves a significant demagnetization of, uh, of uh, the material. <clears throat> and because of this, uh, there is a much larger energy length scale uh, involved in the process, uh, which is the uh, magnetic exchange energy is much larger because it has a strong non-relativistic Coulomb interaction uh, origin. Mm -hmm. And because of this, the typical time scales associated with this scenario are on uh, picosecond or even sub uh, picosecond scales. Mm -hmm. Now in uh, ferromagnets and, and ferrimagnets, and this is the topic that has been extensively covered by Alexei uh, Kimel in his uh, tutorial, uh, this uh, demagnetization or significant suppression of the magnitude of the order vector is uh, subsequently followed by a reestablished uh, uh, magnetic order vector, but with uh, its orientation, which is flipped or, uh, or with a different angle. <clears throat> so it's also a, a magnetization reorientation scenario, but it involves this uh, strong demagnetization and uh, this uh, implies uh, much uh, shorter time scales, typical time scales of these uh, of the dynamics of the of the process. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, in antiferromagnets, uh, we will also talk about this ultra uh, this potentially ultra fast scenario, <clears throat> which uh, does involve a significant demagnetization uh, of the system. But unlike ferromagnets or ferrimagnets, uh, uh, we will in the end 
uh, not arrive at a state with a reoriented uh, nail vector or flipped nail vector, but instead we will arrive at a state uh, which has a different type of magnetic texture. So it will be quenched or frozen uh, uh, from the original large, uh, let's say single domain state into a nanotextures multiple uh, domain state without a net nail vector reorientation. <clears throat> So it will share with the ferromagnets, ferrimagnets, this first a stage, but there won't be a net uh, reorientation of the magnetic order vector. And uh, <clears throat> we will talk about the, uh, uh, the pros or the advantages of uh, attempting spintronics and ultrafast switching in antiferromagnets, but we will also emphasize limitations that are inherent uh, to antiferromagnets. And so this will bring us to the last part of the talk, in which we will try to remove these remaining uh, limitations uh, by uh, looking at an unconventional, emerging unconventional phase uh, that we will uh, uh, call ultramagnets, uh, which uh, will inherit many of the benefits of antiferromagnetism, but simultaneously also remove its uh, uh, remaining limitations. <clears throat> so let me start with the first part of the talk. Uh, we're talking about classic reorientation scenario, which is determined by the, let's say, uh, <coughs> intrinsic uh, uh, magnetization precession frequency time scales, and uh, uh, where uh, we are reorienting the uh, net magnetic order vector without changing its magnitude. Now, as I said, in ferromagnets, the typical time scales are determined by the anisotropy energies and on the nanoseconds or sub nanosecond time scales. And the reason why it's just the uh, anisotropy energy involved is that we can have a mode in ferromagnets where all uh, microscopic atomic magnetic moments are precessing or their dynamics is, is, is in parallel coherent. Uh, so there is no mutual canting of these individual uh, magnetic moments. And therefore, there is no exchange uh, energy uh, that couples these uh, moments strongly involved in this dynamical process. And it's just the change of the overall angle of the magnetization with respect to the crystal lattice, and that's uh, governed by typically by the relativistic and isotropy energy. Uh, in uh, antiferromagnets, if we stay on this cartoon level, uh, the dynamics uh, looks uh, principally different. Uh, when uh, an antiferromagnet is excited, then if you look at one sublattice only, for example, at these blue atoms with their respective arrows, uh, you also see a, a sort of a, a coherent uh, precessional motion of them. However, if you compare that uh, to uh, the dynamics of the opposite spin sublattice, you see that mutually there is a canting uh, uh, motion involved between the two opposite sublattices. Uh, so there is both a uh, reorientation of the nail vector with respect to the crystal uh, lattice, and that uh, is the reason why the anisotropy energy is again involved. But there is also a mutual uh, canting between the, the two opposite sublattices, uh, and that means that there is also the strong exchange energy involved. And altogether, uh, the energy scale is just the geometric mean of uh, these two energy scales. And that brings us to the typical picoseconds or uh, hundreds of uh, femtoseconds time scales. Mm -hmm. Now, this was uh, the comparison between ferromagnets and anti-ferromagnets on a cartoon level. Uh, now, uh, let me do this uh, on a more sophisticated level, uh, including uh, some uh, <laughs> more precise uh, pictures of the torques uh, that are involved and then that they are driving the dynamics. And again, I will compare side by side ferromagnets and uh, anti ferromagnets. So in uh, ferromagnets, what we have here is uh, the initial equilibrium orientation of the magnetization vector of the magnetic order vector is uh, this uh, gray, gray greenish uh, arrow. <clears throat> so that corresponds to the equilibrium orientation with respect to the crystal. Now, when we uh, excite the system by applying a, uh, a magnetic field, and this could be a real uh, magnetic field or just some effective uh, magnetic field or effective field that couples to the magnetic moment, 
And when this uh, uh, field, real field or effective field is misaligned uh, with the equilibrium magnetization, there will be a torque because there is this cross term between the equilibrium magnetization and uh, the applied uh, a field excitation. <clears throat> so in the first step, because of this cross product, there will be a torque uh, which will be pointing in the direction which is orthogonal to the plane defined by the equilibrium magnetization and the applied field. <clears throat> Now, uh, because of this out-of-plane torque, the magnetization will develop an out-of-plane component. <clears throat> and now this out-of-plane component of the magnetization, again, through the cross product uh, with, this, uh, with this field, will generate an in-plane torque. And uh, uh, when we sum uh, these two processes up, in the end, what we get is the precession motion of the magnetization around the excitation field. <clears throat> now, without damping, without dissipation, uh, there will be an infinite uh, precession motion, but there is always uh, a damping and dissipation uh, present in the, in the system. So eventually, uh, the uh, equilibrium magnetization uh, through this dynamical uh, precessional process will turn into a new uh, orientation. So this is the reorientation, and it will become parallel uh, with the applied magnetic field. Once it's parallel, there is no torque anymore because the cross product is zero, and this will create a new equilibrium orientation of the magnetization in the presence of this field. <clears throat> now, uh, if we compare that to anti ferromagnets, <clears throat> then here uh, to have an analogous uh, reorientation uh, switching process, uh, we need to generate somehow an effective field that uh, has one sign uh, acting on sublattice A and has an opposite sign acting on sublattice B. <clears throat> now imagine for the moment that uh, you can generate such a field. And in a minute, we will see a few uh, real physical realizations of that scenario. So if we have such a field, then what happens is again, through this torque equation, first, <clears throat> what we get is an out of plane torque uh, which has the same sign uh, for both sublattices. And it has the same sign because uh, the magnetic moments on the two sublattices have opposite sign, the equilibrium magnetic moments, but also the fields that are acting on the two sublattices have opposite signs. So the two uh, minus signs or opposite signs cancel out. And in the end, we have a net torque uh, uh, or we have a torque acting on each sublattice uh, uh, with the same sign. So this is the initial stage, and uh, uh, in analogy to ferromagnets, uh, this is a torque which is driven by this uh, weak uh, externally applied field, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, which would be typically of the scale of the anisotropy field or anisotropy energy. But once we have this uh, out-of-plane component of, uh, uh, of the magnetic moment for each sublattice, uh, what it means is that we have actually canted uh, the two sublattices, which in equilibrium had perfectly anti-parallel magnetizations. Now, because they both develop the same out-of-plane uh, magnetic moment component, uh, they become canted, and that acting against the exchange and uh, field. The exchange field wants uh, to align the A sublattice in one direction and the B sublattice in the opposite direction. <clears throat> so we have now an action of the exchange field, which has an opposite sign for the two sublattices and is acting on this out of plane component of the magnetic moment, which has the same sign uh, on the two sublattices. So in the end, the torque, which is again, the cross product will have now the opposite sign for the two sublattices because the exchange fields at the opposite sign. <clears throat> so as a result, we would have a precessional motion uh, counterclockwise for, for one uh, sublattice and clockwise uh, for the opposite sublattice. And uh, this uh, uh, is the, let's say, a bit more sophisticated cartoonish representation of the animation that I showed in the previous slide that the dynamics uh, in antiferromagnet always involves this uh, canting uh, uh, of uh, the moments, relative tending of the moments for the two sublattices. And that means that it's not only the anisotropy energy length scale uh, involved, but it's also the exchange and that makes the dynamic scale uh, faster. <clears throat> so this was just the introduction of the basic principles 
of the classic reorientation uh, scenario and the comparison of these principles uh, between ferromagnets and uh, anti-ferromagnets. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go through experimental realizations of these scenarios. And again, I will first start with ferromagnets and then I will move on to anti-ferromagnets. <clears throat> and I emphasize that for ferromagnets, what I'm gonna talk about are realizations which are in commercial devices or in uh, devices which are already at a very mature uh, stage of uh, research and development in industry. While of course in antiferromagnets, which is a much less uh, developed uh, and a relatively new area, I'm gonna talk about experiments or maybe proof of concept devices, but certainly not something which is already uh, uh, practically or commercially available. So let me start with ferromagnets. And what we were talking about was, uh, was uh, this classic reorientation uh, switching scenario uh, when you apply a field. And we said that the field could be a classic uh, magnetic field, but it could be some sort of an effective field that couples to the moment. So an example of the real uh, magnetic field is the reorientation of uh, the magnetic bits on a hard disk, hard disk uh, when <laughs> what we're looking at this is individual bits on the medium, on the disk, and they are being reoriented by the application of the magnetic field uh, through this uh, coil, <clears throat> uh, through this writing coil. And so the, the, the process, the switching is controlled by the sign of the applied uh, external magnetic field and the sign of the applied magnetic field is controlled by the uh, sign of the current uh, that is driven through this coil <clears throat> on the right hand. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily uh, an Ersted or, or a real magnetic field. <clears throat> you can have also a different spintronic writing principles which do not involve magnetic field, but uh, still involve something which has a form of an effective uh, field that couples to the magnetization. And so one uh, of those phenomena is the so-called spin transfer torque, and the other one is the uh, relativistic spin orbit torque. <clears throat> so the difference between those two is that in the spin transfer torque, uh, the principle is that we have a device with a reference and a recording uh, electrode, uh, which can represent a bit and can then be integrated into a memory integrated circuit. <clears throat> And here, uh, spins are injected from the reference uh, ferromagnetic electrode with a defined uh, spin orientation, and they are transferred into the recording uh, or sensing element here. And by delivering or transferring their spin angular momentum, uh, they can generate uh, a switching. <clears throat> so uh, it's the effective field uh, that is brought uh, into the recording element via the spins injected from the reference electrode. So it's a basically non-relativistic effect. And it's, it's also very uh, useful a geometry of a device because you can also use this geometry not only to write uh, the information in switching uh, this element, but also to read uh, the uh, written state uh, by a giant or tunnel magnetic resistance effect. <laughs> now in the spin orbitor, uh, you are not injecting uh, spins from a reference ferromagnet but you're using a relativistic spin orbit coupling, which generates a, a spin polarization uh, via relativistic coupling between spin and a linear momentum. And those relativistically generated uh, spins or spin polarization then can generate uh, an effective field which couples to the magnetization and can switch it. Now, uh, independent of uh, um, the scenarios, uh, whether it's a real magnetic field or one of these effective fields, uh, we have always uh, uh, this uh, basic uh, uh, behavior in terms of the writing energy as a function of the field pulse length. So in all switching uh, uh, scenarios, we consider that the real magnetic field or the effective magnetic field is applied for a certain time which is gonna be the tau p, the, uh, the pulse length. <clears throat> now the question is, how does the writing energy change uh, when we change the length of this pulse? <clears throat> and uh, in, uh, uh, in this classic reorientation scenario, we have basically two fundamentally different regimes. <clears throat> uh, one regime is when the pulse length is uh, larger, 
significantly larger than the characteristic time scale of, uh, of the magnet, uh, which determines the scale of its dynamics. So basically the precession time scale of the magnet. So for ferromagnets, that means that if our pulse length is significantly larger than 100 picoseconds, we are on the right part of this diagram. <clears throat> and in this case, uh, independent of the pulse length, we just need to deliver a certain current uh, to generate a certain strength of this effective field, uh, which should be of the order of the anisotropy field. And when this happens, when we have sufficiently strong uh, effective field, uh, we can generate switching. And the strength of this field is independent of the pulse length. <clears throat> and that means that if you look at the joule heating associated with this current, so as long as the current or current density is constant, independent of the pulse length, then as we are decreasing the pulse length, making the switching faster or, or applying shorter and shorter pulses, we are actually uh, requiring less and less energy. So it's favorable to go to uh, fast or, or short pulse uh, switching scenarios because you are actually saving energy. <clears throat> However, once you cross this threshold, that means a pulse length which becomes comparable to the intrinsic time scale of the magnet, the dynamics time scale, we run into a problem <clears throat> because if our pulse length would be significantly shorter than is the typical time scales for the reorientation process, then we will not be able to complete the reorientation. The field would be long time gone before uh, the magnet had time to, because of that field, change its uh, orientation. So at this, uh, in this range, we need to at least keep the intrinsic time scale of the dynamics of the magnet comparable to the pulse length to have a chance of uh, a deterministic uh, switching scenario. <clears throat> and in order to keep the internal dynamics time scales uh, in line with the decreasing pulse length, that means we need to also decrease this, uh, this time scales, we need to start to increase uh, the current or the corresponding effective field that we generate. Because if we increase the field, uh, we will speed up the precession, uh, we will shorten the typical time scale, and that would allow us to keep up with the decreasing pulse length. <clears throat> but that will cost an additional energy because the uh, joule heating scales as a square of current. Uh, so uh, that means that instead of having an energy scaling which is proportional to the pulse length, which was for the short, uh, for the long pulse times. If we go to the short pulses, energy starts to scale as one over the pulse length. So the shorter the pulse, the more energy is needed for switching, and very quickly uh, uh, the switching becomes energetically prohibitive. And this is the uh, one of the fundamental reasons why it's so difficult in ferromagnets through whichever scenario you can generate this effective field to move to a uh, uh, shorter pulse length uh, to ultra fast switching because it becomes energetically very costly. So obviously, uh, if you uh, use instead of ferromagnets and antiferromagnets, uh, you can imagine that this threshold would be moved by two or maybe three orders of magnitude to uh, shorter pulse times. And with still this classic reorientation scenario, we will not hit this uh, fundamental energy scaling problem until we reach the picosecond uh, time scales. <clears throat> so uh, uh, in antiferromagnets, there was a pioneering experiment uh, already uh, nearly two decades ago uh, uh, done in, uh, in the Nijmegen group, uh, uh, which uh, showed that indeed uh, using antiferromagnets, uh, uh, you can have uh, a very fast picosecond time scale classic reorientation scenario. <clears throat> uh, but as I said in the beginning, you somehow have to be able to generate this specific uh, field uh, excitation where the field has one sign when acting on sublattice A and has the opposite sign when acting on sublattice B. <clears throat> so for example, it would have to be an anisotropy field because the anisotropy field is indeed having opposite signs for opposite sublattices in an antiferromagnet. <clears throat> and so the Nijmegen group 
uh, came up with a, with a scenario where you can actually control uh, the crystal direction of such an, an isotopy field in an antiferromagnet, uh, and specifically in this uh, uh, iron oxide uh, antiferromagnet, where uh, you have a transition uh, at about uh, 85 Kelvin, where below uh, this uh, transition temperature, the anisotropy axis is pointing along the z direction, uh, while above 85 Kelvin, this anisotropy field is pointing along x direction. <clears throat> so if we uh, assume this, uh, we start the experiment below 85 Kelvin, this would be the equilibrium uh, orientation of our uh, easy axis, meaning also of our sublattice magnetization. But uh, by delivering a short uh, uh, picosecond laser pulse, uh, the system is heated up above this transition. And so it means that the effect of this uh, laser pulse is equivalent to uh, generating a pulse of an anisotropy field, which is pointing, uh, or anisotropy fields with opposite sign for the two sublattices pointing in a different direction than is the equilibrium uh, orientation of the magnetic moments. <clears throat> And indeed, it was shown in these experiments that the reorientation uh, can occur on these very short uh, picosecond uh, time scales. <laughs> now, a caveat to this is that it's, uh, it, it demonstrates the classic reorientation scenario, but it's not really a, 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 a switching uh, because uh, once the system cools down after the laser pulse is gone, uh, the system goes back to the base temperature and in the base temperature, the anisotropy axis moves back to the original state. So the system does not remain in the switch state, but it uh, comes to the original state because of the nature of, uh, uh, of the way how this anisotropy uh, field was generated. <clears throat> so uh, this is one uh, problem that the field of antiferromagnetic spintronic was facing is can we have another source of this uh, uh, field, which is opposite signs for the two sublattices, but could generate a, a, a stable switching between different orientations of the nail vector. And another question was that, uh, can we do this in systems which are conductive and not an insulating oxide in order to uh, be able to also integrate uh, these devices into microelectronic chips? and having the possibility of controlling them not only by light, but also by, uh, by electrical pulses and also read the signal uh, uh, electrically. <clears throat> so uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the field of metallic or conductive uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics, where the basic question uh, uh, was, uh, what is the physical principle that we can use for uh, electrical uh, switching and also for electrical readout in uh, anti ferromagnets. <clears throat> so uh, we cannot use spin transfer torque and giant uh, or magneto uh, or tunneling magneto resistance effects. And this is because uh, in ferromagnets, we have the privilege of uh, having the possibility to inject spin polarized currents from the ferromagnet. But uh, that is not possible to do uh, with a conventional anti ferromagnet. <clears throat> However, what turned out to be a possibility was to use the relativistic effects and come up with an uh, antiferromagnetic analogy of the spin orbitor, and then to use relativistic uh, magnetoresistance phenomenon, the so-called anisotropic magnetoresistance, which is equally present in antiferromagnets uh, for the electrical uh, reader. Uh, but as I said, the uh, spin orbitor has to be adjusted uh, because uh, it's not uh, um, useful in an antiferromagnet to have a relativistic phenomenon which generates a uniform spin polarization. Instead, you need to have a, a, a scenario in which uh, by applying uh, an electrical current uh, through your antiferromagnet, uh, the electrons would split by spin uh, in a way that one uh, spin polarization would be generated in the vicinity of one uh, magnetic sublattice while the opposite spin polarization of these electrically driven electrons will accumulate or go by the opposite spin sublattices. So this staggered or, or, or opposite spin polarizations of this uh, uh, current carrying electrons can be generated in crystals with certain 
uh, broken inversion symmetry of this uh, magnetic sublattices. And an example is copper manganese arsenide. <laughs> so again, in a perfect analogy to this cartoon, just by applying um, an electrical pulse, uh, this relativistic effect will generate an effective field which has opposite sign on the two sublattices, and you can then employ this uh, classic reorientation scenario. So uh, now going uh, through the through all the scales, all the way from the macroscopic device uh, through uh, micron scale imaging of the switching process, and all the way to this uh, atomic scale uh, mechanism of the switching, uh, uh, we can see how that process works. So <clears throat> we have a device and we will control the switching, uh, the reorientation switching by the sign of the writing electrical pulse. So this will be in a perfect analogy to uh, ferromagnetic spintronic devices. Now, if we change the polarity of the writing pulse and then go to uh, uh, a microscope uh, that has the capability of imaging anti-ferromagnetic domains, what we see here in this X-ray microscopy that we have a large micron scale domains which are being switched in a reversible controlled way by reversing the pulse polarity between one nail vector orientation and an orthogonal uh, nail vector orientation. And uh, uh, again, the microscopic scenario or mechanism is this uh, relativistic spin or the torque. <clears throat> Now, if you look at then the electrical response uh, to this opposite polarity pulses, what you see is resistive changes, which are non-volatile, which are stable uh, between lower and higher resistive state, uh, depending on the polarity of the current and corresponding to the 90 degree reorientation of the nail vector. Now, when we look at the uh, current densities and the corresponding energies required for switching at these short nanosecond pulses, they are actually comparable to the spin orbit switching in ferromagnetic uh, devices. You can also have non-volatile memory functionality, but because the whole physics is relativistic and relativistic phenomena typically are weak, then the switching signals uh, that you detect uh, are much weaker than the giant or tunnel emitting resistance. They tend to be on the order of a fraction of a percent or maximum a percent. And this is one of the key limiting factors in antiferromagnets is that the, the relativistic uh, scenarios that you need to involve will suppress the magnitude of the signals. And that has a major consequences on the speed of devices as well, because in particular for readout, if you have a small signal, you have to repeat the measurements uh, or the, the readout uh, uh, um, pulses many times to separate uh, the real signal from noise and that will slow down the overall performance of your device. <clears throat> so uh, we went through the, uh, the first part, compared uh, ferromagnets and ferromagnets, discussed the advantages, which in antiferromagnets was the shift of the threshold uh, to a much uh, shorter pulse length in principle, but also limitations of antiferromagnets stemming from the relativistic nature of the involved processes and the corresponding uh, weaker signals than what you have typically in ferromagnets. Now let me move on to the second part to this ultra fast scenario, <clears throat> which as I said, involves demagnetization. And now we'll start with ferro or in particular with uh, ferry magnets uh, um, and then move on to the antiferro magnets. <clears throat> so uh, let me show here on this uh, ferry magnetic gadolinium iron cobalt on this cartoon, uh, the principle of the uh, demagnetization and reorientation ultra fast uh, switching scenario. And I will emphasize here on this cartoon that it's actually quite uh, uh, advantageous to have uh, two opposite uh, spin sublattices because they can exchange angular momentum among themselves uh, uh, and by this facilitate the, uh, the reorientation without necessarily involving the outer environment. Uh, but it also is, is essential for this uh, demagnetization and reorientation scenario to have a non equivalent uh, magnetic sublattices with a different size of the magnetic moment. And it's not just that, that the gadolinium in this particular case has a four times larger magnetic moment per atom than iron, but you also need to have a, a magic ratio of the, uh, of the number of uh, gadolinium and iron 
atoms, in particular here, uh, 2.5 more iron atoms roughly than the gadolinium. <clears throat> so it's a, a certain alloy, alloying that is favorable and also a certain ratio between the sizes of the magnetic moments. And why is it so? So let's go step by step through the reorientation uh, <clears throat> uh, mechanism by just demagnetizing the system. So uh, <clears throat> uh, the de demagnetization would go through an uh, exchange of angular momentum between the two sublattices. So imagine that you are start to demagnetize the gadolinium, uh, the red gadolinium sublattice. You flip <clears throat> one gadolinium moment. And if you want to conserve the overall angular momentum, you will make opposite flips of four uh, iron moments because the ratio of the moments is approximately four. <clears throat> now you continue in this process, you flip a second uh, gadolinium uh, moment. And what you see here is that already an interesting intermediate state. Well, while gadolinium still has a relatively large magnetization in the original direction uh, for the iron sublattice, it has already completely demagnetized and even switched uh, uh, um, uh, its net magnetic moment in the opposite direction compared to the original state. Now, when I flip next gadolinium atom here, I managed to demagnetize gadolinium and I already have a, a fairly strong uh, magnetization on my iron lat lattice, which is pointing in the opposite direction compared to the original state. <clears throat> and uh, uh, now at this state, it becomes energetically favorable for the system to continue in this way. Uh, there is a next uh, reversal of gadolinium, which already causes the gadolinium sublattice to reverse its magnetization compared to the original state. And the iron sublattice has even larger uh, uh, magnetization and again, opposite to the original state. So as you see by a single shot of a uh, laser, uh, which can be polarization independent, it doesn't matter uh, what's the linear polarization or whether it's circular or linear polarized, uh, you can just deliver this toggle switching. Whenever the system is hit by the laser pulse, it will demagnetize and flip its uh, magnetization. But what you saw uh, for having the reorientation it was very important to have this very magnetic state with these magic ratios between the moments and the number of these, or the, uh, the number of the different magnetic atoms in the lattice. So you can imagine an antiferromagnet where you also would have this uh, exchange of angular momentum, but you would not have this additional uh, benefit of this ferry magnet of arriving at a state which has an opposite a magnetic order vector. <clears throat> so that brings us to the question. Uh, whether we can have at least some analogy of this ultra-fast uh, uh, demagnetization-based switching scenario in antiferromagnets. <clears throat> and the answer is yes. Uh, however, uh, the result of the switching process will not be a reversal or reorientation of the nail vector of the antiferromagnetic order vector, but it will be a change of a state from this large domain state, which is, uh, which is close to the ground state of the system, into a metastable state, uh, a metastable state, which is as many domains is nano fragmented uh, text state, which however can uh, persist at uh, macroscopic time scales. And the reason is that in antiferromagnets, because of the lack of stray fields, uh, it's difficult for the antiferromagnet to get rid of these textures. And if it does it, it does it on very long uh, uh, time scales. <clears throat> so the experiment goes like that, you apply again, writing pulses, but now instead of changing uh, polarity, you are changing the size or the amplitude of the pulses. <clears throat> and you can do this electrically by delivering electrical pulses. And now you do not rely on any subtle relativistic spin dependent effect. It's just an electrical pulse, <clears throat> which uh, uh, allows the system to be demagnetized. And instead of electrical pulse, you can also deliver uh, optical pulse. And that optical pulse can be ultra short all the way to a single a uh, uh, femtosecond uh, laser pulse. <clears throat> now, whether you do this electrically or optically, the phenomenology of the resulting switching is uh, completely analogous. And what happens if I look at the microscope <clears throat> is that uh, the switching is from these large equilibrium uh, antiferromagnetic domains into this nanofragmented state, uh, which uh, is not a ground state, However, it's a transient state which, have, which can have macroscopic time scales. <clears throat> now, uh, when I look at the corresponding uh, electrical signal, what I get is that, uh, as I said, you can do unipolar 
electrical or, or polarization independent optical pulses, uh, where you can now scale them all the way from millisecond electrical pulses to a femtosecond laser pulse. Uh, for a nanosecond electrical uh, switching, you have current densities and corresponding densities, which are comparable again to uh, ferromagnetic uh, uh, current switching. But now you can go to these uh, ultra short uh, switching pulses uh, uh, using also light. <clears throat> and when you look at the energy density required uh, for switching, it's comparable to the energy density required for the uh, single pulse switching of the ferry magnet of the Galilean cobalt uh, ferry magnet. So we are on a comparable energy uh, uh, scales as in ferro or ferry magnets, and we can also do this ultra fast uh, <coughs> uh, switching. Uh, although we don't know, of course, what is the dynamics, how long it takes for the system to reach this state. But what we know is that we can do it by delivering just a single femtosecond laser pulse. <clears throat> now, when you look at the uh, readout electrical signal, now you actually get larger signals than before in the reorientation switching of an empty ferro magnet. It's on the 10%. Resistive changes scale or reflective uh, changes scale if you do it optically. And at low temperature, it even becomes 100% scale. So it becomes comparable to a GMR uh, like signals, although it has nothing to do with giant magnetic resistance. And uh, uh, you see that uh, after switching, there is a slow relaxation on macroscopic time scales at room temperature uh, and it becomes completely stable. So it's highly thermally activated at 200 Kelvin or so it's a stable. A non volatile switching. <clears throat> uh, this gives you also a possibility of, of having a much richer phenomenology of the switching signal than in the reorientation switching, what you typically have in uh, ferromagnets. Uh, uh, your uh, signal, because it has this analog multi level time dependence, uh, it can uh, uh, be sensitive to the uh, strength of the pulses, but also to the order of the pulses and also to the delay between the pulses, all that now matters uh, for the resulting uh, readout switching signal that you get. And uh, altogether, uh, these uh, different scenarios can mimic functionalities that we know from not digital, but from analog uh, neuromorphic like computing, uh, where you need to know uh, what is the order and delay between pulses, and or you want to generate this lead to sum a functionality which also depends on the amplitude and on the delay between pulses. So that, those are the functionalities that correspond to the synaptic strength setting or the neuron potential setting in artificial uh, neural networks. So antiferromagnets through this scenario do give you a, a possibility to go into this uh, research direction. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, to study the, uh, the ultra-fast dynamics of this switching would require the techniques that Alexei what is, was describing in great detail uh, in his talk. But what I'd like to emphasize here is that in parallel, you would also uh, need to involve uh, techniques which have very high spatial resolution. First of all, because you're dealing with antiferromagnets, so you want to know what is going on with the spins on with the sub-lattice resolution but also because the switching involves these nano textures. So it's very important to know what is the elementary texture scale in these systems. And for this, you need also the very high resolution real space uh, <coughs> uh, imaging of the process. But fortunately, uh, we uh, very recently, there's been a development in the technique of scanning transmission electron microscopy, which does give you this uh, subunit cell spin resolution in antiferromagnets. It was uh, in parallel. Uh, demonstrated uh, by, by two groups and independently. So this is a technique that is now available. And through this technique, it was possible to visualize in the antiferromagnet that shows this demagnetization nanotech sequencing uh, that the elementary excitations uh, that can be transient uh, <coughs> and uh, can be stationary in the system are actually atomically sharp domain walls. So it's a, it's a texture in which the magnetic order vector abruptly changes across uh, a single atomic plane. <clears throat> now, if you look at that uh, object here, it is actually uh, a giant or tunneling magnetoresistive junction with whose uh, junction or the spacer thickness is scaled down to the minimum possible size, which is just one atomic plane. <clears throat> So that uh, looks like a, a very uh, tempting scenario that uh, you can generate 
instead of growing artificially layered structures uh, for giant and tunnel magnetoresistance resistance effects, these are sort of self-assembled, <coughs> self-generated, uh, ultimately downscaled uh, giant magnetoresistive resistive junction you could have in a magnet. However, in antiferromagnet, those would not show the giant magnetoresistance resistance effect or any analogy because there is no spin polarization of the current that you can generate in an empty ferromagnet. So the dream would be to have a system which allows for these features, uh, which is all because of the zero net magnetization would allow for these uh, atomically sharp textures and for this very fast dynamics that we have in empty ferromagnets because of the vanishing magnetization, but simultaneously would provide all the phenomena like giant magneto resistance, spin torque, et cetera, those non-relativistic spin current phenomena uh, that uh, are provided by ferromagnets. And it looked like these two worlds are completely incompatible and we cannot uh, get to that point. So in the last part, in the last uh, uh, a few minutes of my talk, let me just give you a, a hint that uh, there might be uh, a third a basic magnetic phase, an unconventional phase, which would allow uh, to combine the benefits of zero magnetization and of the presence of uh, spin polarization, spin polarized currents, uh, non-volatilistic that we're used to from ferromagnets. And the phase I'm going to refer to are ultramagnets. And uh, the term is because <laughs> the characteristic signature of this phase would be alternating spin polarizations uh, when we look at the magnet from the real space, but also when we look in the electronic structure momentum space, we will also observe this alternating sign of the spin polarization. It has to be alternating because there is no net uh, magnetization or no net spin polarization in the system. So uh, what would be then the, uh, the landscape of these uh, fundamental phases uh, that we will have available? Uh, so there will be these two conventional phases that we're used to uh, for many, many decades, uh, conventional ferromagnets. And I will also uh, put ferry magnets under, under this umbrella because of the uh, same characteristic features. And then the conventional phase of uh, antiferromagnets and finally this uh, emerging unconventional phase. So what are the key characteristics? In ferromagnets, uh, you have one spin sublattice with or spins pointing in one direction. Uh, in ferry magnets, you may have more sublattices, but anyway, uh, they will be different. So they will generate a strong non-relativistic uh, magnetization in principle. <clears throat> now, as a result of this strong non-relativistic magnetization in the system, you will have two key features in your electronic structure. First of all, you will have lifted spin degeneracy. Uh, which allows you to generate the spin polarized currents uh, from a ferromagnet. And second, uh, the bands will break uh, time reversal symmetry, meaning that if I reverse my momentum from plus to the minus momentum, and I also reverse the spin uh, because of the time reversal operation, I will not arrive at the same state. So as you see, a uh, uh, time reversed momentum gives me the same spin, which means that the uh, time reversal symmetry is broken. <clears throat> and that's very important because that allows for phenomena that break time reversal symmetry. And those phenomena are giant magneto resistance, tunneling magneto resistance, spin transfer torque, anomalous Hall effect, and the whole family of spintronic phenomena that we are used to in ferromagnets and that many of the commercial devices are, are, are based on. <clears throat> now, if I move on to a, a conventional antiferromagnet, I do have uh, two sublattices, and I have a crystal symmetry uh, that connects the two sublattices. So if I do, for example, translation, I will map one sublattice on the other, or if I do an inversion uh, of the crystal, I also would map one sublattice on the other. If that symmetry is present, it guarantees uh, that the net magnetization is zero if the moments on the two sublattices are pointing in the opposite direction. <clears throat> and as a result, what I get is spin degeneracy in bands, and I get time reversal symmetry of my bands. <clears throat> so all these key features of the electronic structure that generates uh, the strong non-relativistic spintronics and ferromagnets is absent by symmetry in these conventional antiferromagnets. However, if I move on to this uh, uh, third phase, where I also have two sublattices, 
they are again connected by a crystal symmetry transformation. By in this case, it is not inversion, it is not translation, that is the third option that we have, and the third option is rotation. <clears throat> if the two sublattices are connected by crystal rotation, that also guarantees vanishing net uh, magnetization if the two magnetic moments are opposite on the two sublattices. So that makes it reminiscent of conventional antiferromagnet. However, if I look at the electronic band structure here, then uh, the rotation transformation does not impose spin degeneracy, and it does not impose amorphosis symmetry of my band structure. And in fact, I can have very strong lifting of the spin degeneracy analogous to ferromagnets, and I can have very strong breaking of the time reversal symmetry, again, analogous to ferromagnets. <clears throat> but as you see, uh, so you would uh, uh, say that on this uh, electronic structure, this is just like a, a ferromagnet, but I'd like to emphasize that it's a it's an unconventional magnetism because what we are familiar with from ferromagnets is the so uh, is in principle an S wave type of ferromagnetism that means isotropic. <clears throat> uh, while here you see that this is an unconventional magnetism or ferromagnetism, if you want, because it has this D wave symmetry. And uh, if you recognize the analogy between conventional S wave superconductivity and unconventional D wave superconductivity that indeed uh, this analogy is not just in terminology, but there is a deep connection between those two uh, principles in superconductivity and in magnetism. Uh, now, uh, 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 let me just give you one illustration for all the effects uh, that now you can generate in these compensated ultramagnets. Uh, that uh, are reminiscent of what we are used to from ferromagnets. And they all originate from the fact that now we have strong, uh, strongly lifted spin degeneracy and we have strongly broken time reversal symmetry uh, by this non-relativistic uh, magnetism. <clears throat> so uh, uh, the effect, uh, 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 which would be an illustration for all these phenomena would be giant magnetoresistance. So for giant magnetoresistance, what you need is when you apply electrical current through such a magnet, you need to generate spin polarized electrical current. <clears throat> and as you see, because of this D wave character of the splitting of an outer magnet here, when I apply electrical current, I will generate more blue, uh, that means spin up electrons than the red uh, spin down electrons. And just by applying an electrical current along one of these two principal and I saw the axis of the D wave uh, magnet, I will generate strong spin polarization. So I can start to think of scenarios of two uh, ultramagnetic electrodes that are either in parallel configuration of the magnetic order vector or anti-parallel configuration. And in a complete analogy to ferromagnet, you will get a giant magnetoresistance uh, effect. <clears throat> and uh, 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 from numerical uh, calculations, you can show that uh, they can be also magnitude wise, they can be comparable to ferromagnets. That means uh, you can reach the scales of, uh, <clears throat> of hundreds uh, percent for giant magnetoresistance or even larger for tunneling uh, magnetoresistance. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, let me move on to uh, uh, final two slides uh, <clears throat> where I'd like to emphasize that uh, if you want to talk about a phase uh, in, uh, in, uh, in physics, in particular in condensed matter physics, uh, uh, typically phases are defined by symmetry, and you need to have a separate a symmetry class uh, uh, to make a legitimate uh, uh, classification of, of a phase. And this has been done also for this emerging uh, ultramagnetic phase, which you can uniquely uh, classify and describe uh, by specific uh, spin symmetry groups. And so this gives you not only the opportunity to separate all uh, ultramagnetic material candidates from the conventional antiferromagnets or ferromagnets, but also give you a chance to see what are the possibilities of these uh, anisotropic uh, um, compensated by spin split and time reversal broken band structures, what type of band structures you can have. And if you go through all the possibilities, you see that you can have not only this D wave symmetry, but you can also have higher anisotropy uh, uh, waves uh, like a G wave or I wave symmetries uh, in these systems. 
And this uh, classification also gives you a chance to associate uh, uh, the symmetry with a specific real material candidates. And uh, uh, there will be, uh, there are surprises when you do this because you will recognize that this uh, strong non-relativistic splitting does exist in many systems which were studied for decades in the community and where the splitting was assumed to be zero because they were considered as conventional antiparameters. Uh, and in, in the examples are the parent coup rate of high TCD wave superconductor, this lanthanum and copper oxide, or a metallic high nail temperature chromium antimony. All these can hold splittings in chromium antimony, even on the scales of, uh, of more than one electron. So uh, this uh, brings me to this uh, first concluding slide, uh, which shows that with this new <coughs> uh, emerging phase, uh, you can study uh, not only consequences for spintronics, including ultrafast or neomorphic, but many other fields uh, in which uh, a third type of magnetic phase can bring features which are unparalleled in ferromagnets or anti-ferromagnets. <clears throat> and uh, this is also underpinned by the fact that these uh, ultramagnetic candidates have been identified among many different uh, uh, material types, three-dimensional and two-dimensional, two-dimensional insulating, semiconducting, semi-metallic, metallic, and even superconducting. And in many crystal or chemistry types of rutiles, perovskites, cuprates, ferrites, et cetera. <clears throat> So uh, this is the final slide uh, where I'd like to wrap up that uh, <clears throat> with uh, anti-ferromagnets, uh, uh, we were uh, exploring the possibility of uh, interplay between spintronics, ultra-fast uh, uh, magnetization dynamics, and even uh, neuromorphics. But it also led us to uh, uh, identification of a, a new emerging phase, unconventional phase that we call ultramagnets. And a combination of all these uh, emerging scenarios gives up, give us a chance that we can have a field <clears throat> of spintronics without magnetization, without relativity, that would be simultaneously offering uh, not only digital, but also analog, more complex information coding down to femtosecond pulses or femtosecond time scales and even atomic length scales. Uh, in combination with phenomena that we're used to from ferromagnets, that means strong spin splitting, spin currents, giant magnetoresistance, and TMR-like phenomena. So uh, my time is up, and uh, I thank you for your attention. Uh, I would like uh, to thank you very much for, uh, um, for a clear, insightful, and um, exciting lecture. Um, and I will see if there are some questions, and I think uh, there is Sumit who raised his hand, so I will promote him to be a panelist. And um, please go ahead and ask a question when you're ready. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you for this wonderful talk. I have a question regarding the switching of antiferromagnet. So when we switch an antiferromagnet, does it go from one stable state to another or it is just switching between different ground state. Uh, so uh, what I was trying to illustrate were two very different switching scenarios mm -hmm. that, uh, that they, can be, they have been demonstrated in antiferromagnets. So the first scenario uh, was <clears throat> the scenario, let me just, uh, I'm sharing screen still. So uh, the first scenario was the one uh, where, uh, where was I? Uh, let me just find it. Okay, it's here. So can you see the slide even without? Yes, the screen? it's fine. Okay. So in this case, uh, when you look at the microscopy image, I am mm -hmm. controlling in a deterministic way yep. by changing the polarity of the electrical pulse, mm -hmm. whether I am coding uh, one type of domain with one angle of the nail vector or, or orthogonal angle of the nail vector. Uh -huh. Because I have a cubic, uh, in-plane cubic crystal, they are both equivalent easy axis. So they are both equivalent in terms of energy ground states. And this is the reason why I have really a non-volatile switching here, mm -hmm. uh, where both states, they have <clears throat> different resistance because I am probing uh, these states by a certain direction of an electrical current while the nail vector, uh, while the nail vector is either parallel or orthogonal. Mm -hmm. So the relativistic AMR is telling me which state I am because it would correspond to different resistances but in terms of magnetism and energy, they are equivalent. 
So they are both ground states, okay? So this, was the, this is the first type of uh, switching scenario. The other one is uh, switching between, uh, <clears throat> oh, let me move on here. Uh, it's switching between something which is a ground state. So I have a large domain pointing mm -hmm. along one of the easy axes into something which is not a ground state, which is a metastable state. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is this microscopy image where I'm really changing the domain texture or the structure of the domains by the switching pulse. Mm -hmm. In this case, I'm controlling the size of the signal that I code, electrical signal, by the amplitude of the pulse, not by the polarity or direction of the pulse. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, and one of the states is more stable and the other one is less stable. But nevertheless, because I, do, because I do not have strain fields, the system, when it's quenched into this metastable state with many of these atomically sharp domain walls, it actually takes a macroscopic time scale for it to find back uh, the way to the original ground state. So this is the reason why I can use it for device uh, mm -hmm. functionalities because I can get macroscopic time scales. Um, in principle, even non-volatile signals also through this switching scenario. Okay. I see. So in general, what would be the typical lifetime required for this kind of operation? For example, let's say typical what? Typical lifetime of my let's say this uh, excited state. For example, if I want to record my picture in a hard disk, then mm -hmm. I need a permanent switching like your first example. Yes. But let's say if I just want to do a summation, uh -huh. I have to get this uh, metastable state stable for let's say one nanosecond within which I will do my computation and then I don't care. Yeah. So, so uh, it's uh, in analogy to ferromagnetic hard drives and MRAMs, uh, it's an activated uh, um, uh, characteristics. Mm -hmm. So when you say that in hard drive, we have a 10 years retention, it is at room temperature. If you would heat the system up, it would have would exponentially lower the time. And if you would cool it down, it would be exp exponentially larger because it's just a, uh, it's, an, um, it's a thermally activated process across the barrier, the energy barrier, which is separating the two equilibrium states, okay? Now, when we look at this uh, uh, switching scenario here, it is also very strongly thermally activated. I even have here uh, 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 a real measurement of this. So uh, um, it has multiple time scales, but let's let's focus on the black one on one time scale. So what happens is that if you are at uh, uh, at uh, let's say uh, room temperature or at low temperature, so this is a measurement at room temperature where the time scale is about tens of seconds uh, of the retention. This is 200 Kelvin, where it's already perfectly non-volatile, uh, and if you pull down to uh, lower temperature for this specific system, it would be, you know, uh, infinite uh, in terms of laboratory times, infinite uh, retention time. Yes. However, if you move to higher temperatures, uh, you will actually, so in the, in the range of infinite temperatures, if you want, you see that the retention times is in 10 to minus 13 seconds. So it's sub picosecond. Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you heat the system up, uh, because it's exponential, uh, you will have a much faster process because it's thermally activated. So if you want, depending on the temperature at which you operate the device, uh, you will have either a, a non-volatile behavior or you will have very fast uh, uh, relaxation behavior. Mm -hmm. But you say, okay, controlling uh, temperature in a device can be tedious, but this just, the, the, this, the scale is controlled uh, um, uh, by a, a factor which is this energy barrier for this activated process, okay? This mm -hmm. energy barrier that you have. And uh, we see that even in a single device, we actually have multiple uh, relaxation time scales which differ by different uh, energy barriers. So uh, this tells you that even one device, uh, we can operate at a given temperature uh, we can have part of the signal which is non-volatile at, uh, at uh, operating temperature and the other signal which is actually very uh, quickly relaxing and the, the difference is the several orders of magnitude. This is even within a single element within one device because it's a multi-component uh, activated uh, behavior. But you can also imagine that by tailoring this barrier, which is basically some energy barrier for the relaxation in different materials, you can get to many different time scales of the relaxation and you can get a control. Of course, you need to understand first what are the physical origin of these barriers. So this is something that needs to be explored. But these experiments show you that there is a possibility.
to do this. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I uh, don't see any further questions. So if I may, I would uh, like to go ahead. Um, regarding the work on electromagnetism, um, and specifically, I understood that ruthenium oxide was selected because it has a very pronounced spin splitting, I, if I remember correctly, 1400 milli electron volt. So it's much more uh, significantly pronounced in other metallic and insulating antiferromagnets. And also there's some kind of trend. Um, between uh, uh, metallic and um, insulating um, materials. So my question would be, uh, I understand why it is uh, uh, to say interesting for the ruthenium oxide. Um, and I would like to ask if you could uh, um, elaborate a bit on what potential you see uh, in, in fluorides with uh, um, fluorides, dielectric fluorides compared to uh, metallic materials like ruthenium oxide. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for, for this question. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, I confirm uh, that in uh, ruthenium dioxide, this is uh, uh, now becoming a workhorse material for spintronics research in these ultramagnets. And the reason for this is that it's, first of all, metallic, which is unusual for oxide rutals to be metallic, but it's nicely metallic. Uh, so you can make uh, conductive devices, electronic devices. And second, it also is a room temperature. Uh, system, which is also not that common in rutile uh, systems where the uh, fluorides are typically low, much lower uh, nail temperature systems. Uh, so uh, this is the reason why it becomes uh, so prominent. But another reason, as you mentioned, is that the spin splitting, as you see here, it's actually enormous. It's, uh, it's electron volt scale. So all that combined means that we can start to do all sorts of experiments. And there are, there are indeed first experimental indications that you can generate strong spin polarized currents, you have strong anomalous Hall effect and all that in ruthenium dioxide. Now your question was about uh, comparison to insulators and whether there is some principal reason why in insulators you would have weaker effects, for example, weaker splitting, et cetera. So <clears throat> I do not see a particular uh, reason why in general insulators should give you a weaker splitting or weaker ultramagnetism than, uh, than the metallic systems. Uh, the reason why it, it, the, the splittings tend to be weaker in these fluorides, but uh, you know, this can be very specific. They have the same crystal structure. So the crystal symmetries are identical, but it also matters what are the orbitals uh, that are involved in setting up the magnetic states and how these orbitals are actually sensitive to this rotation symmetry and other symmetries in the lattice, whether they do reflect are more sensitive to the crystal symmetry or less sensitive. Mm -hmm. If you have orbitals which you know, uh, don't really care about the symmetry of the lattice because their nature is very isotropic, for example, then, and if these were the orbitals that were, that were key for setting up the magnetic state uh, and the splitting, you would not see very large splitting because they would not respond too much to the symmetry, to the overall symmetry of the lattice. So it's also the chemistry, uh, the microscopic details which would determine the splitting, but not necessarily metallicity versus insulating character. And I give you an example. One example of an insulator is manganese telluride or mm -hmm. a semiconductor because it's yep. a low gap insulator. And the uh, splitting in manganese telluride is again above uh, electron. Volt. So you can, uh, we have an example of an insulating system which has a very strong uh, splitting as well. So, uh, <clears throat> but the, the, the matter of fact is that for this particular family of rutiles, um, uh, these fluorides, but also it applies to the oxide uh, with manganese, they tend to have weaker splitting than the uh, ruthenium. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thanks a lot uh, for, for the extended answer. Um, am I correct that you excluded cobalt difluoride, but only cobalt trifluoride is included uh, in the class of ultramagnets? Uh, well, it really depends on the symmetry. Uh, so you have to have a certain symmetry of the crystal, which basically means you have to have some sort of a rotation symmetry that connects to opposite sublattices, which could be uh, 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 rotation, uh, uh, which could be also rotation in combination with inversion. So improper rotation or proper rotations, both are fine. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be also non-symorphic rotation, which means that it could be a rotation connected with a partial unit cell translation. So uh, but that's basically it. That is exhaust all possibilities. And so now it matters what is your crystal structure and what is your expected or known magnetic order, uh, whether you do have such a connection between opposite uh, sublattices. 
So as you see, uh, uh, these are just examples uh, of materials that uh, we identified. But if uh, co cobalt uh, diafluoride uh, would crystallize, would stabilize in a ruthile structure with these antiparallel moments, it would also belong to the ultramagnetic class, okay? So it just matters what is the crystal structure of the system and what is the magnetic order on top of that crystal structure. And uh, the spin group uh, classification gives you a complete answer uh, to whether a certain crystal is or not an ultramagnetic and how it can magnetic candidate. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. I think uh, there are no further questions. So um, I would thank you again for, uh, for a wonderful talk and for um, um, extensive answers. And um, yeah, I, I think I'm looking forward to see uh, all of you uh, next week. At least I see from the attendees that all of them will be present. And uh, I would close the, the seminar for today. Thank you, Thomas. And see you on Monday. Yeah, see you. Okay, Bye -bye. See you. Thanks, Thomas.